one. Hey everybody, I am live and uh, welcome to the first in what this week is going to be a series of talks with people who are my friends, but they also have played very prominent roles in the history of Oakland and in, in politics and government and and business. So tonight I've got my longtime friend Clinton Killian. How you doing, Clinton? Good, Vinny. How are you, Vinny? Uh, outstanding. And tomorrow night I'll have my other longtime friend Steve Lowe, who Clinton knows. <laughs> Um, try to get them all in the same room at once, but this is the next best thing. And then on Tuesday, Thursday, I will have actually on Wednesday at two o'clock, I'll have another longtime friend, Lee Steinberg, and we're going to talk about his client list. That's at two o'clock Pacific. And then on Thursday at nine o'clock at night Pacific, uh, at eight o'clock at night Pacific, excuse me, we're going to have. Another longtime friend of mine who's involved in Oakland, and that is Chris Dobbins, who's on the Coliseum Joint Powers Authority. But tonight is Clinton night, and so, uh, and uh, I promise you, folks, uh, you're in for a ride. So buckle up, and uh, Barry Lee, great to have you here. And Clinton, you're not familiar with my format, but I'm on YouTube, and on the right, uh, I have my chat area where I'm viewers place postings, and Barry Lee is one of my Bet my best people and moderators and friends and Barry Lee, if you're going to tweet, please tweet out hashtag Oakland and hash, hashtag Oakland, hashtag Raiders, hashtag NFL. Uh, yeah. In, in there, Raider Nation. Okay. Hey, Clinton, you're a great, yeah. you're a great longtime lawyer in Oakland. Tell my viewers what law you, what area of law you practice in, by the way. Well, I'm primarily a real estate business and probate attorney. Mm -hmm. I uh, represent everyone from property owners, homeowners, to developers and commercial landlords and tenants. That's quite a, quite a list. And also, you've held a, a number of, you ran for office, what, twice? Three times? Well, I ran for office when I lived in West Oakland, when I first came to Oakland back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And then I ran for office here in Montclair when I moved up here and ran for the at-large seat. That's right. I remember that. Right. And you've been on how many boards and commissions or just an advisor to how many people? I mean, you're quite, you're quite, you're quite sought after by people like Port Board. President Michael Cole Bruno, who says you're one of the most knowledgeable people in Oakland about politics and business. Well, I believe in in civic duty and public service, so I have served on a number of uh, voluntary boards to give my time to a city that I I love and I enjoy living here, and I saw its potential when I was in law school and. That's what brought me to Oakland, and I haven't regretted it. But I served on the AC Transit Board for a number of years. Um, I served on the Oakland Planning Commission. I um, served on the uh, Paramount Board for a number of years. I have been, not now, but in the past, I've been a very active member of the Oakland Chamber of Commerce, and now I serve on the board of the Oakland Builders Alliance. Oh. which is a group of developers, real estate owners, and people involved in the real estate industry who are working to build Oakland. Wow, we have a lot to talk about there, too. And you're also a longtime Oakland Raiders fan as well, right? I was. I grew up in North Carolina watching the Raiders when they played on NBC in the old AFL. I still remember how they got robbed by the Jets in the 69 title game with the New York Jets yep. when the uh, fourth down play by Hewitt Dixon and the referee turned the ball sideways when they measured for the first down. <laughs> oh, jeez. It almost reminds me of... Uh, the Raiders the ball and they lost 13-7. to seven. Almost reminds me of Gene, I call him Skeletor, the guy that had the card that measured... For the uh, yeah, yeah, remember that against the Dallas Cowboys last season. Yes, instead of the 
Yeah, instead of the ball pointing goal post to goal post like it does in every football situation, the referee turned the ball and pointed it sideline to sideline. Yeah. And they measured it. <laughs> the Rangers missed the first down by an inch. Very, very but of course, there's no conspiracy in the NFL against the race. Oh no, not at all, not at all, not at all. No, no not, not, not at all. Hey, before we talk about the Raiders, I want to talk about a case that uh, has well, it's grown into basically just that. It's between two very prominent Oaklanders, uh, former Black Panther Party uh, member Elaine Brown and Oakland current city council person, uh, Jesse Brooks of District 6. And it was, a, a to put a long story short, just in the interest of time, uh, the two had a disagreement at a place called Everton Jones Barbecue. And depending on who you believe, what happened, one thing is clear, that two things are clear. First of all, the two had an argument uh, that led to Desley claiming that Elaine was poking her and threatening her and Desley supposedly in retaliation pushed her and accidentally in the act of pushing her managed to, she fell over some chairs and that resulting impact caused a rotator cuff damage. Ms. Brown's, uh, there was no, no criminal trial just filed by the Oakland police, but Ms. Brown took it to a, a civil uh, perspective in terms of a lawsuit, won the lawsuit for uh, unbelievably $4 million. And now we're sort of in a limbo period where uh, some in the other type of media, as I call it, have been calling for her censure and others in the black media have protected her. And sadly, it's divided to that way. But you know, Clinton, you know, both of these folks, I believe. How, how do you see this case? How do you see the situation? Well, you know, Vinny, in my earlier life as a lawyer, I spent 20 years as an insurance defense attorney. Um, for example, when you get in a car wreck and the other side is going to sue you, you call your insurance company and they offer you a defense and they hire an outside attorney. And that's what I did for all kinds of insurance issues. For about 20 years uh, in the first part of my legal career. So the, the case really from a, a lawyer, particularly a defense lawyer's perspective, was botched from the very beginning by the city. And so the outcome really wasn't that surprising. You see, when you have, are an employee or subordinate to an entity, then you have a right to ask them to defend you when you're being sued. And if your position is, I'm being sued for actions that occurred while I was in my employee or performing services on behalf of my superior entity, then that's called tendering a uh, claim. You call your insurance carrier or your superior and you say, hey, I'm being sued for something I did while I was at work. You need to defend me. Well, at that point, the carrier can say, no, we're not defending you. And they could reject their obligation to, to defend you. Or they could say, okay, we don't think we're liable for your actions. So we're going to defend you but we're going to reserve our rights, which means at any time they can say, you know what, we found new information, or we just changed our mind and we're not going to defend you any longer. Or the other alternative is to say, you know, our interest and your interest are not the same. In this case, it's in the city's best interest to say, we have no liability for your personal actions. And so, therefore, we're not going to defend you, and we, obje we uh, object to having any liability for your actions. And then the other side can say, well, you still have the right to defend me. So the uh, city could say, we're going to hire what's called a Kumis Council, which is we're going to have our attorney operate the case in our best interest, 
And then we're going to hire another attorney to protect your interest. And when they, our interests diverge, then you have an attorney to protect you and the city has a protect, an attorney to protect them. And then the last thing and the most um, regular or common thing that occurs is the insurance company or the employer will file when the lawsuit starts what's called a declaratory relief action. And what that is, is that's a, uh, a motion you file in front of the trial judge and you say, Your Honor, we need you to determine what our liability and rights and responsibility is in this matter. Was she an employee? Do we have to defend her? Are we liable for her actions? And then before the case even starts, the judge will make a determination about that and issue a written order that clarifies all the parties' respective rights and obligations. Well, none of this was done by the city of Oakland. <laughs> they defended, That's not funny, but it's funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's hilariously funny. <laughs> it's like showing up at a football game with no footballs and saying, yeah, but we're going to win this game. <laughs> So what the city did was Desley, uh, Councilwoman Brooks, tendered her defense. It was initially rejected. And then he, the city said, okay, well, we'll defend you anyway. And so by tying themselves to the person who's accused of the battery, whatever you try to say to defend yourself, you're not. You're very limited because you can't say anything that's going to hurt the interest of your subordinate. In this case, Councilwoman Brooks. So, the plaintiff's attorney, you know, is like shooting fish in a barrel for them. Well, the city painted itself into the corner, and then it just moved in and and beat the city over the head with Des Desley Brooks' uh, actions. And now that's why the city is liable. Wow. So Barry and Lee. And by the way. Sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. By the way, you kept mentioning that the plaintiff, Ms. Ms. Brown, mm -hmm. did this and sued and all of this. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to understand that she had a very capable and very well-respected personal injury attorney by the name of Charles Bonner. Glad you mentioned that. Go ahead. And Charles please. Bonner... Charles Bonner has been a well-known plaintiff's attorney for a number of years going back to the 70s. Charles Bonner served as a board member of the California uh, Trial Lawyers Association, which at the time was the Plaintiff's Personal Injury Bar Association. It's now called the California Consumer Attorneys. But Charles was one of the board members that helped found this organization. John Burris, when he started practicing law, used to work for Charles Bonner. Hmm. So Charles is well known in, in personal injury circles as an extremely competent attorney. And he has sued the city of Oakland a number of times. If you've been in Oakland for a while, you may remember a couple of cases where children drowned at city of Oakland swimming pools because I sure do of lack of well those are Charles Bonner's cases hmm. so Charles is no legal lightweight and in fact he's what you would call one of the most respected um, personal injury attorneys in Northern California and so he actually seized upon the city's uh, lack of protecting its own interest and he tied the city to Councilwoman Brooks and let me tell you there's an old maxim in defense law mm -hmm. if you have an old lady plaintiff an elderly woman who is injured by some sort of violence mm -hmm. that's a loser case because the jury is not going to give you the benefit of the doubt when they see an injured elderly woman who was assaulted 
and that's you don't you're not going to win those cases. I mean, you think about it. If you're sitting on a jury and you see a 70 some year old woman who's being sued because she was assaulted and battered by a younger person. There's very little defense you're going to have to that. And uh, so this case was a series of errors by the city and in the way they handled the defense. And as a result, this cost them. And it's probably going to cost them more. And by the way, what most people don't realize, a personal injury judgment, once that judge signs it into law, into as a judgment, it starts collecting 10% interest. Oh, my God. An appeal will take three years. Hmm. So quite frankly, I'm sure the plaintiff and her attorney is saying, go ahead and appeal it because I can't get 10% in the, in, in, in the stock market. There's no <laughs> bank that's going to pay me 10% interest. So by all means, appeal it. <laughs> Which gets to the question that we and I talked about off camera so a few days ago. Is the case appealable? And that's what Barry, well, Barry Lee was asking you know, just again, now. Again, an appeal is not, well, we disagree with the jury's finding. Mm -hmm. You have to show that there is an error of law mm -hmm. or that the jury had no basis for coming up with their decision. That's a huge mountain to climb. First of all, the judge was very, very meticulous in making his rulings so that there's very little margin of error for his ruling. I mean, what's the city going to say? Um, she was not an employee at the time and she was not conducting city business at the time. Well, the city's already admitted to that. So what's the, what's the basis of the appeal? We were wrong. <laughs> do over. Let, let, let's try it again, you uh, Court of Appeals. No, you don't get a second bite of the apple. There's a video. And $3.75 million, is that unreasonable? Well, you have a woman who had to have a couple of surgeries, medical bills probably in the six figures, mm -hmm. pain and suffering for a 74-year-old woman mm. who, you know, fell over chairs tore a rotor cuff, had to have surgery. You stop and think about it, $3.75 million is not that far out of the realm that it insults your senses and your sense of fair play. No, you're right. So there's a very narrow win window of an appeal. And like I said, an appeal accumulates 10% interest from the day the judgment is signed. So in three or four years, you know, that's another million dollars right there in interest. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, video that was put out, uh, I believe, on the Chronicle website that purports to show Ms. Brown in an argument with a security guard who didn't push her, which uh, I felt was disturbing to watch in and of itself, but that's another story. But the idea advanced by some is, hey, the jury didn't see this, and therefore the jury should see it because it would paint a different picture of Ms. Brown. Your thoughts? And and that's exactly why they didn't see it. First of all, it's hearsay. Mm -hmm. There's no audio to the, to the video, mm -hmm. so you don't know what exchange was going on or what caused it. Mm -hmm. So there's no foundation, as we say in legal terms. Mm -hmm to or authentication of what actually was going on. Secondly, the police report and the reports written by the employees and the people who said that they saw this and she appeared to be this way, that's all hearsay. Mm -hmm. Police reports are not admitted in the civil trial as evidence because it's hearsay. Do you know what hearsay is? Not hearsay is an out of court statement that's attempting to be used to prove the truth of the statement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you and I were suing each other because I continue you ran a red light and hit my car, mm -hmm. and I give a statement to the police in, in the uh, police report that says, 
Vinnie Abraham ran the light. It was red to his side, and he crashed into my car. Mm-hmm. Well, just because I told that to the police officer and he wrote it in a report, that doesn't make it true, does it? No. no. That's what hearsay is. So everything in those reports are just pure hearsay. And a video that is ambiguous and there's no audio and you can't tell what it's actually portrayed to be, for all you know, the person working at this hotel could have been threatening her. Mm-hmm. I have a gun in my pocket and I'm going to shoot you 25 times. Mm-hmm. And she reacts and pushes the person down. Well, you can't tell that that didn't occur from the video. So it's speculation what occurred. Mm-hmm. And there's a very simple thing in a basic maxim of law. Even if I committed nine murders before, that's not evidence that I committed the tenth murder. Mm-hmm. So you can't prove what I, what I did in the future by something I did in the past. If that was the case, mm-hmm. then we'd all be in jail. <laughs> well, Vinny, you're from Georgia, and 40 years ago a black man in Georgia stole a peach. Therefore, you're a thief. You go to jail. Oh, well, because it's a I mean, peach, right? I get you. It doesn't work that way. So, again... It, all of this, this tabloid news, thank God, does not make it into the courtroom. The okay. law does not deal with speculation. It deals with facts. Huh. Hey. And if you can't prove it, you don't get to come to court and speculate about it. Not that I want to take the conversation in this direction, but I have to ask, is that a good something for our listeners to pay attention to with respect to social media and, and the, the consistent slamming of each other that happens? Well, it all depends. Mm-hmm. As long as it's just you expressing an opinion, that's one thing. Right. Don't take it to violence <laughs> or <laughs> retaliation mm-hmm. on someone's property. Mm-hmm. Because then, and again, the difference between a video of something that happened 10 years ago and me posting on social media something hostile or threatening to you and the next day your car blows up, <laughs> mm, that's probably a little more connected than you and I arguing in 2005 whether Stanford was going to be Cal in the big game. Which we, which, which we have done, folks. He uh, got his undergraduate degree at Stanford and his law degree at Berkeley. That's the smarter part of his brain, but that's another story. <laughs> well, and let's be clear, I have no divided loyalties. True. Stanford has a football team and Bolt doesn't. So I play for Stanford every year in the big game. <laughs> this is Clinton's platform. Otherwise, I would, I would have oh, a rebuttal. Way, you know, you've been to the Rose Bowl a few times. You guys should, uh, when I say you guys, I mean you cow bears. You guys should come to Pasadena on New Year's Day and check it out. It's really a wonderful game. We'll, uh, we'll be there sooner rather than later. But since this is your platform... Well, you I have... know, the last time Cal won a Rose Bowl was 1937. Uh, this is... You better hurry up. Your centennial is coming up soon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Folks, Clint Killen is, uh, aside from my good friend, now and, and Stanford Brewster, uh, a Raiders fan. So what do you think... Talk to me first about your thoughts about the Raiders trying to move to Las Vegas? And I say trying because it has a lot of difficulties. I, I think it's, it's an extremely, just from a pure business sense, it's a dumb move. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you are building a billion dollar plus stadium in the middle of a desert where you don't have the population base to to support a major league football team. So you're going to be dependent on people flying into Las Vegas on the weekends to watch a game. Mm -hmm. And that's going to get old pretty quick. Yeah, you're going to have a few thousand people who may do it every Sunday. But realistically, you know, you're trying to fill up a 60, 70,000 seat stadium. And the whole thing about going to a Raiders game is being able to tailgate and be outside hours before the game. 
I don't know about you, Vinny, but standing in the middle of the desert <laughs> for a football game just doesn't sound like my idea of something fun. <laughs> and apparently they're not even going to build any area for any great tailgating like currently exists at the Coliseum. So what are they going to do? Tailgate in a parking garage on the strip and then get in a, a bus and go to the game? I mean, it, it makes no sense. Hey, Barry Lee says, and, and don't forget quite about... frankly, I... Barry Lee uh -huh. said, Barry, Barry Lee, my, one of my viewers, he says, don't, and don't forget about the sandstorms. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I don't see, I, I think, you know, unfortunately, I think the owner of the Raiders saw fool's gold in his eyes. And like most people go to Las Vegas, they have dreams of winning and they get their asses whooped and their money taken. And somehow that's what this feels like to me. Oh, hey, by the way, before we uh, continue on the Raider path of discussion, Barry Lee threw in a question uh, that deals with our last, the first part of our, our segment of our talk. And he asks, uh, do you think that social media outlets like YouTube have an obligation to root out and better prevent anonymous users from bad remarks like racism and har harassment? Um, well, it, it all depends. I mean, if you are, my, my feeling of it is this, mm -hmm. if you're trying to have a legitimate, uh, discussion of legal topics, social topics, anything that's more than just name calling in the back alley of a street, mm -hmm. then absolutely you need to, you need to identify and own up to who you are. Most newspapers in this country for generations have never accepted anonymous letters to the editor. Right. Because they, you, you, in order to have an intelligent discourse, you have to be able to identify who you're talking with. Mm -hmm. And we already see what happened in this last election. These fake Facebook persons, these Russian bots, flooding everything in our election. And I don't know about you, Vinny, but I can remember getting some of those things in my Facebook uh, thread mm -hmm. and looking at them like, where in God's name did this come from? Yeah. And you click on the person's name and there's no face, there's mm -hmm. no where they're from, there's nothing about them. And you're like, this is like a fake account. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And... If you're going to have an intelligent discourse, I mean, if you want to do it like Reddit or some of the others where you can go in and say anything you want and remain anonymous, well, go ahead. That's your form. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to play in a legitimate form where ideas are being exchanged, then I think it's imperative that a person has to identify themselves. Now, getting back to the Raiders, uh, Barry Lee, I actually... Uh, I want to share with the audience what you did when you learned and your friends learned that the Raiders were going to try and relocate to Las Vegas. Well, you know, I, I, I think I, I shared this with you a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. My family and I were, I'm from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that's where I was born and raised until I finished high school and was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to Stanford. Well, my brothers and my uncles have been diehard Raider fans, like I said, since the 60s. And so when my oldest brother retired, as a retirement gift, what I did was, and this was all oh, about five years ago, mm -hmm. I got a box and about, I don't know, 10, 15 people from North Carolina came out. We got another 15 or so people here in the Bay Area. And we had a Raiders celebration. We got tickets and a box. They flew out. And my brother to this day still talks about how that was the best present he's ever gotten. And so it was so much fun, we did it every year. And uh, you, I got 
pictures of my nephew standing in the black hole, you know, pictures of us going to tailgate parties all through the parking lot and my brother taking pictures of everybody in their Raiders gear. And every year it was, it was a celebration and a good family get together. Well, when we started hearing that the Raiders were thinking about moving and we sort of discounted it, well, last year when the owner announced that he's definitely going and he's in Las Vegas signing documents and smiling with the Raiders, I mean, with the uh, Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce and holding fan appreciation days in Las Vegas instead of Oakland. <laughs> we all just said, you know what? We're not doing this again. And so even though the game that we had targeted to go to was the Cowboys game in early December, we didn't buy a box this year, and we're not going to buy a box again. And we're not going to fly all the way across country to see the Raiders play because it's one of my relatives said, why should we give money to somebody who's running out the door to go to go uh, give it to somebody in Las Vegas? That's even with a Gruden hire? I think, you know, John Gruden has been, first of all, John Gruden has been out of the coaching for over 10 years. Secondly, when he was coaching, he didn't do that great. Look at the personnel moves he made at Tampa Bay. Mm -hmm. When they fired him, Tampa Bay was, well, was was a destroyed franchise and never got close to the Super Bowl again. Yeah, that is conveniently so forgotten. See, <laughs> huh? I said that is conveniently forgotten in today's narrative. Exactly. You know, so I don't see how he's going to make some great change and that he's some great mastermind. I mean, if this was Bill Walsh you had hired, I'd say, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but John Gruden, this is like hiring a C student and expecting him to figure out what DNA is. I mean, come on. <laughs> he's, not, he's not the brain surgeon that they're making him out to be. Man. Oh, Somehow, man. I'm also a little concerned that a 55 year old man's nickname is Chucky, and they said <laughs> his famous scowl is what's going to win games with him. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> hey, so Barry Lee on that note asks, he says, What do you think about them paying, the Raiders paying John Gruden a $100 million you know, salary, $10 million a year? Well, I, I think it's a boondoggle, <laughs> and he's not going to produce anything that's going to be worth it. And my advice to John Gruden is get your money now because the owner may not have the money to support that check he wrote you. <laughs> <laughs> now, and he, and he should ask him, you know, be since since uh, the Raiders owner decides he likes playing in Mexico better than Oakland. I mean, my God, what moron owner says to your home audience, yeah, we're going to take the former Super Bowl champs, the team that we're going to play, and instead of playing them in front of you, we're going to take them to Mexico and play them. I mean, come on. Now we got, uh, let's so see. John better read... John Gruden better read the contract very carefully and make sure he's not being paid 10 million pesos and it's actually $10 million. <laughs> They've got, uh, let's see here. Now you've got, uh, first of all, Barry Lee says he can, can agrees with everything you're saying. And yes, that they should have a, uh, a face. That's, that's the other uh, issue we're talking about. CSU asks, go CSU ask, uh, what do you think if the Raiders feel could fall through and also for the Raiders that they could stay in Oakland. In other words, do you think this could happen? This is his question. Well, it, it, it could happen now if there was better leadership from the owner's chair of the Raiders. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the days of a public entity spending a billion dollars to build a stadium are over, especially in California. 
it's just not going to happen, especially a stadium where they're only going to play 10 games a year. Mm-hmm. Now you got, and so, sorry. huh? Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was, I have another person responding, but I'm just going to wait for you to um, finish your and statement. And so, if, if, uh, if they even make it to Las Vegas will be one thing, but if they don't, then they're going to have to look at a public-private partnership to get a new stadium built. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be on the backs of of the taxpayers. We're still paying for the 1993 renovations made to the Coliseum. Yeah, that's true. We we are. Now, Quentin Rowe says, well, Tampa was handcuffed draft-wise for they had to give up two first round and two second round picks plus $8 million to get Gruden in 2002. Sounds like sour grapes to me. Now I'll respond to that one. Uh, Clinton's not talking about, you have to remember Gruden was around for a lot more than that one year. And the first year he took Tampa to the Super Bowl, And then the next year, he was there for what, four or five years, I believe. So what, what Clinton was there to 2009. So he was there to six years. Yes. Yeah, so that's quite a long time, uh, Mr. Rowe. And so you have to remember, we're not talking about a short period of time. We're talking about quite a chunk. And so from the back, from that perspective, I think Clinton is, is right on in terms of Gruden's, uh, having that. And not, and not only that, not only that, how many first round draft picks have the New England Patriots had in the last five years? <laughs> None. <laughs> So do you think a uh, first round draft pick? Well, they've had uh, well, 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 well. I mean, to be fair, the, it's the one Patriots, player. The Patriots, so unless his name is 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 you know, super duper star, is not going to make a whole lot of difference. Right. The thing that made John Gruden a poor person in in Tampa Bay, aside from you know, the, the league caught up with his offense very quickly, was he was a very poor evaluator of talent. Mm-hmm. And he made some horrendously crazy trades. He drafted extremely poorly. And by the time he got fired, there was virtually nothing in Tampa Bay's cupboard. That's right. Whoever the person is that asked that question, name any all-star that was on the Tampa Bay team the last year Gruden was coach. Go ahead, name them. There you go, Clinton. There you go, Mr. Rowe. And Mr. Rowe says New England had one takeaway, but they generally trade down for additional picks. But, Quentin, I think your statement, you know, buttresses what what what, what Clinton is saying. Uh, Quentin and Clinton. <laughs> but what Clinton is saying. But then Barry Lee uh, asked wants to know a question for you. He says, do you think there's a case for the NFL not following their own relocation rules? And I have to say, you know, St. Louis has basically opened the door to that because the judge in the St. Louis case said, hey, look, you know, the relocation bylaws are actually a contract and therefore you have the right to go to trial. And that's where that is. I didn't know if you knew that or not, Clinton, but, you know. Um, well, I mean, you know, St. Louis is giving it its best. The problem that St. Louis is going to run into is the same thing that Al Davis ran into 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. The NFL is a voluntary association, and they make their own rules. And so a local judge in St. Louis trying to give the city some kind of leeway, Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think it's going to work. Stan Kroenke is going to have next year his stadium completed. There's no judge in the world, and there's no law in in America that's going to require him to walk away from his multi-billion dollar stadium to return to St. Louis. Actually, that won't be until 2021, by the way. Okay. So he's got a while. But he'll have the stadium built before there's a trial in St. Louis, I guarantee you that. You don't think the NFL will want to sell and f- avoid the discovery period and what might come out of that? And the reason I ask the question is because the St. Louis example illuminates a playbook the NFL has used both for St. Louis, Oakland, and San Diego that 
basically says, hey, the relocation bylaws are just internal, but the judge in the St. Louis case is saying no, and what's going on in the Oakland case right now is that you have five different attorneys that approach the Oakland Raiders fan club, we stand with Oakland and forever Oakland, saying, hey, look, we want to take your case on contingency because we believe we can win, which didn't happen last year when they originally marched forward with uh, Jim Quinn and Eric uh, Rothschild, and they wanted to get paid up front. This was entirely different. So, I mean, given, given that, I mean, doesn't it, <laughs> doesn't it sound like there may be a development here that could turn out in St. Louis' favor, or maybe the NFL would say, hey, you know, we'll settle because we don't want A, B, and C, and D to get out in the public? I don't think they worry about what gets out in the public mm -hmm. because... NFL was like General Motors. Mm -hmm. They have a whole they have a whole corporate secretary who keeps minutes on every discussion, and anybody can see them who's a member, which any of the thirty two teams can see it. So I don't think they're going to find any great surprises there. Mm -hmm. And again, the NFL is a voluntary association. It's just like if. Uh, you became a headmaster of a Boy Scout troop. You have to agree to abide by the Boy Scout rules. And if the board of directors of the Boy Scouts change the rules, for example, if they decide they're going to let women jo or little girls join the Boy Scouts, and you object to that, well, unless you can get some votes on the board to change the policy, policy, then uh, you're not going to have a whole lot to work for. Mm -hmm. And any bylaws can be changed. I and mean, all that takes is a majority of the members to change the bylaws. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the bottom line is St. Louis is, you know, they're exercising their rights and I wish them all the luck. What I don't see is anything that that they're going to get in fruition with, and there's not a whole lot to settle with it. I mean, what are they going to settle for? You give us the next expansion team? No, they they they, well, they no, want they want they want, getting, they want monetary damages. That's that's expressed mm -hmm. in the lawsuit. They don't want that. They the, the okay, and, well they you know. Can, you know the NFL can throw money at them. Stan Kornicki is married to the third richest woman in in, in the country, if not the world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she can throw down some Walmart stock and it all go away. <laughs> St. Louis's problem is unlike Oakland or San Diego, for that matter. Mm -hmm. St. Louis doesn't have the economic base to support a full-fledged team. Mm -hmm. And so the, the biggest problem they have is the owner of the Rams could very easily say, this is the basic economic reason I moved. I'm in L.A. now. I'm in the second largest city in the country. Right. And I'm building an entertainment center. And St. Louis, well, what am I going to get there? Purina Dog Chow is, is the biggest <laughs> corporation in St. Louis. And oh, by the way, you got these crazy cops killing black people, so no free agent wants to come to St. Louis because they're afraid they're going to get shot. So, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I don't, you know, they don't have a, they can get some damages, yeah. Oh, actually, it's Anne Hyder. Anne Hyder. Anne Hyder Bush, you know, by the way. $10 million. It's, it's Anne Hyder. So Kroenke can write them a check. It's Anne Hyder Bush, by the way, the beer makers. I think they're the largest. Well, Anheuser Busch is no longer locally owned. They're owned by a company in Belgium. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, hey, so but in the Oakland case, we have it where I mean, the Raiders are not moving to a, a larger media market by any stretch of the imagination. By any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> And going from like five to one twenty-two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Clinton, there's another case that. For us, it's a matter of good faith. I got the commissioner to say, this is on video, okay? This was at the NFL 
spring league meeting of two of 2016 in Charlotte, North, uh, excuse me, in Charlotte, North Carolina, I got him to say, hey, uh, in response to my information to him that the Raiders had been going behind our back and negotiating with Las Vegas, which is a violation of the basic good faith, you know, you know uh, clause in the relocation agreements, as well as the NFL constitution. And the commissioner said, among other things, that the Raiders' situation in Oakland was, and I quote, partly their fault, unquote. I never heard anybody from the league point even a partial finger at the Raiders as the commissioner did that day. So why not pursue? I'm not saying just on that basis alone. And there is a lot of evidence going back ooh, to, to 2011 of violations of good faith. Uh, ad infinitum. Why not sue on that basis? Well, go right ahead. This this is America. That's <laughs> why we live in this democratic society. Mm -hmm. Anybody can file a lawsuit. I think your biggest defendant, though, is not the NFL. It'll be the uh, the Raiders team itself. What do you mean? And well, they're the ones who were acting in bad faith, not the league. Right. That's exactly my point. That was my and point. So, to, that was my point to so, Goodell. Right. The problem, though, of suing the current owner of the Raiders is he may be judgment proof. How so? What does that mean to the lady? Judgment person? proof means you don't have enough assets to pay the judgment if it's entered against you. Well, what? Let's see. What does he own besides his interest in the Raiders? He owns a '93. Plymouth Voyager van mm -hmm. and a, a house in Palm Springs bottle and and beer bottle collection. So and he's got a house in Palm Springs. He, he just okay, he so, just remodeled. Yeah, worth several million. Yeah, I think. but yeah. Well, but he's probably the poorest. He's probably the poorest owner in the NFL right now. Mm -hmm. Even the guy, even the family in, in Arizona is much more equity uh, laden than he is. Only then John Santos just added, he says that Mr. Davis has a house in Alamo as well. <laughs> I'm sure he's got a mortgage on the house in Alamo too. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, and I was being somewhat facetious, but... I think the better, the better claim is against the Raiders itself rather than the NFL. And, and on that note, and you and I were talking about this, uh, that Mark Davis may have some personal guarantees tied up in Vegas. I haven't been able to confirm that or deny it, you know. But if it's the case, I mean, if he's spending maybe $200 million of his own money, and couldn't someone sue for his controlling interest in the team? Well, um, the Raiders are owned by a limited partnership. Mm -hmm. And the, what that means is there are general partners who own part of it. And then they elect a person called a managing partner. And when they elect the managing partner, they draw up an agreement on how the managing partners to operate the partnership. And unfortunately, those are all private documents and agreements between private parties. Mm -hmm. So I've never seen the Raiders limited partnership agreement or the managing partnership agreement. So I don't know what rights and what violations it would be necessary for the uh, the the limited partners to vote out the managing partner. Hmm. But I tell you one that I'm sure is lurking around there somewhere, which says that the managing partner must manage the partnership in a financially prudent and responsible way and not incur losses for the partnership. Ah. And if you screw up, I'm pretty sure that's a reason to remove you. Ah. <laughs> So riddle me this then. I have reported on my space here several times that the Raiders stadium situation in Las Vegas is looking at uh, 
a $27 million annual deficit in operating expenses over operating costs. And the way you manage a football team is such that you build your stadium to make money to run your team. You don't build your stadium to take money from your team. But essentially, the Raiders are building a stadium that, as it looks right now, is going to take money from the team. Isn't that something? Even Davis said that I might go broke or I could grow broke trying to do this. But that's his statement. Do his partners, limited though they may be, have anything to say? According to you, they do, right? No, well, no. I, what I said was okay. I've never seen their agreement. Oh, that's so true. You did say the that. agreement governs what you can and cannot do and what liability you will incur whether individually or to his interest in the partnership mm -hmm. <coughs> and what penalties occur if he doesn't manage it properly. That's all determined by the uh, partnership agreement. Ah. But to get back to your original point about personal guarantees, mm -hmm. I cannot imagine that he is in this situation with virtually no asset base to borrow and incur liability for as large as he has without having some kind of collateral or personal guarantee involved in this. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, is, is just not, it's not good basic business sense to loan someone a million, a billion dollars and they don't have the ability to pay you back. Yeah. So, <laughs> There has to be some pledge of assets or, or guarantee of, of personal assets to be able to get that kind of money. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, um, I was uh, listening to one of your other uh, YouTube posts, an uh, earlier one about Sheldon Anderson. Adelson, Sheldon Adelson. Or Alderson, Alderson, whatever his name is. Adelson, Adelson. I honestly think the whole reason he got involved in this was there had to be some kind of guarantee that he would get a percentage of the Raiders. Mm-hmm, yeah. And you know, that was what he was getting out of it because nothing else makes sense. And it also makes sense why he pulled out of it. Mm-hmm. Because I'm sure he doesn't care about a, whether a football team is in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like the, the obvious play was, sure, I'll, 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 you know, guarantee this money for you to build a stadium. But in return, I want a percentage of the team that I could purchase for X number of dollars based on how much I'm putting into this deal. Hey, so... But that's interesting because Adelson dropped primarily because he felt that Mark Davis was working behind his back. And what happened was that, and for those who watching who may not remember this or know this, what happened was that the original UNLV joint use agreement was introduced. This was February 20th of 2017, and it was actually leaked, okay? Uh, at the time it was leaked, you had... Andy Abood, who works for Sheldon Adelson, with Mark Bedane. At the same time, you had Mark Davis with Mr. Adelson actually talking about how the stadium was going to design. They actually were doing more than talking. They were planning such things as material, fabrics, that sort of thing, all right? Down the minutia. And Adelson got wind of it through Abood while Abood was driving with Bedane that this joint use agreement uh, PDF file proposal was released and it made no mention of Las Vegas Sands or Mr. Adelson getting any percentage of anything or having anything. And they hit the royal ceiling. And in a famous entry in the Las Vegas Review Journal dated, if my memory serves accurately, 20, February 26th of 2017 at about 324 in the afternoon p.m., uh, Mr. Adelson said that, hey, look, I'm not involved in this anymore. And, you know, primarily because I can't trust Mark Davis. And he felt blindsided. He also said that he was quite upset over the way UNLV was treated in the original joint use agreement proposal. Um, 
Now, what he took out with him was 650 million, not, not, only, not only 650 million that he pledged, that was the documentation, but a stated agreement, stated and repeated that at, at all times, they would be responsible for covering operating losses and cost overruns. You hear that? Operating mm -hmm. losses and cost overruns. Now, the media, which has no clue how this stuff works, reported that, oh, Mark Davis is going to go and get Golden, Goldman Sachs to replace a guy who's worth $30 billion. Yeah, right. Forgetting that it just so happens that one of the clients that Goldman Sachs has is that guy that's worth $30 billion. You hear what I'm saying? <laughs> so they turned around and they, Goldman Sachs says, we're not messing with him. Forget it. You have to find somebody else. So almost mm -hmm. at the last minute, Bank of America stepped up in the form of Elliot McCabe and said, oh, we'll do this. Basically, what they're fashioning is the same kind of loan they gave to the Falcons here in suburban Atlanta. Well, here in Atlanta, not suburban Atlanta. I'm in suburban Atlanta. But they gave to the Falcons. The difference, Clinton, is that the Falcons have managed to structure over a billion dollars in sponsorship commitments from such organizations as Mercedes-Benz, which has its name on the stadium, to Coca-Cola, mm -hmm. to Porsche. I mean, you have some of the largest companies in the world have chosen, have either grown up here, like Coca-Cola, in the Atlanta area, or relocated to Atlanta, as Mercedes-Benz did, because at one point they were in Princeton, New Jersey, right? So this place has become enormous, and it may even add Amazon. You want to compare that to Las Vegas, which has its large as its largest employer, Las Vegas Sands, who I might add, its board had said that they are not going to take a financial position in the Raiders deal. They left it all to Mr. Adelson himself. So when Adelson walked and then Goldman Sachs threw up their hands and said, no, we're not going to do this. And then Bank of America came in. It was still reported, oh, the Bank of America is going to replace Adelson. And then, and I kept saying, you, that bank is not going to replace a guy worth $30 billion. So here comes Elliot McCabe on October of last year. I think it was October, second week in October at the Las Vegas Stadium Authority meeting. In this presentation, he said, and I quote, we will not be responsible for cost overruns <laughs> or operating losses. It's a straight loan. Okay. So I thought, you know, how much more Looney Tunes do we have to actually you know, here before we get that this thing actually isn't going to pencil out. And to this day, the Raiders have not signed their non-relocation agreement. On the Friday of on Friday of this week, in closed session, the Raiders will be at the Coliseum discussing a lease agreement. Uh, they're still trying to work that out. I got Mark Bedane to admit in Las Vegas while he's with the Vegas reporters, which I think pissed him off that, hey, you know what? <laughs> yeah, we're talking with Oakland, okay? But hey, look. Honesty is the best policy, uh, I think. But at any rate, that's that's the situation. And in all this, you know, you have people saying, it's going to be done in 2020. It's going to be done in 2020. And I'm saying, look, you would have to start now to build that stadium in 27 months to reach June 2020. Not only has it not been done before, but think about it. Of all the documents, Clinton, there's like 32 total documents 14 of which are primary. Of the 14, only two have been completed. Of the two that have been completed, the one, the UNLV Joint Use Agreement, still hasn't even been approved by the Las Vegas Stadium Authority, <laughs> you know, let alone the governor. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, you know, I can, I can just... So what that also means, what also that means is there's no money in the pot. Because the bank is not going to release or even commit their money right. until the agreements are all executed and airtight. Because Absolutely. Yep. News slash banks are not in the business of losing money. <laughs> banks hey, can, are worse can you than repeat casinos. that, please, for the brethren? You... The, only person who, <laughs> the only people who walk away from bad loans and make money off of them are banks. <laughs> <laughs> 
So wait, are you telling me that basically you know, the Raiders are setting themselves up to make money for Bank of America because the way the deal is set up? I mean, check this. There's no they don't the Raiders don't pay rent in the standard sense of the term. The way they structured it, Mark Arnold's their attorney out of Houston. I forgot the the, the firm name, but he told me that the way it's set up is that they regard the bond issue as and the payment of the bond issue as rent and that's basically a leasehold so basically if the raiders can't pay or if that bond issue goes south all right that's considered the rent and what happens is that if it goes south which is actually starting to do already which is the other thing okay it, it, get this then the raiders they get evict the raiders <laughs> that's the way that's the way the documents are written and so now we have a well, situation, you and, know and, and, and so I know you have a point, but let me just interject right here. Yeah, sure. Here. Uh -huh. And that's that's basically the standard way that any home mortgage is written. If you read the document, it says deed of trust and assignment of rents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, any time a bank loans you money to buy property, they also are having you pledge whatever income comes from that property to pay them back. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> now, you know, if you buy a single family house that you're living in, there's no, there's no rent coming in on it. But any other, I mean, it's just a standard thing. Like I said, banks are not in the business of losing money. Mm -hmm. So all of these sharks in Las Vegas and all these sharks in the financial world, they view Mark Davis as a piece of raw meat, and they're all ready to, to chow down on him. And if he gets out of this alive, I will be very surprised. That's what we're all waiting for. Because, just... because you know, if, if the, the Coliseum Authority really wants to really screw him, they don't have to extend his lease. They could say, you know what, Mark, you want to go to Las Vegas so bad? Well, go ahead. We're going to bring in, you know, monster trucks on Sundays. So we really can't rent it to you this year. So good luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Larry Reed wanted to do that. That's what Larry wanted to do. And and quite Larry, frankly, Larry, Larry's I think it would be a great business decision. Say, you know what? We're good. Oakland. We're good, Raiders. Go ahead. Go play in San Antonio or... In somebody's backyard in Las Vegas until you get a stadium built. You're cold, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, on that, hey. I have to ask you this question. How do you think the mayor handled this situation on that, you know, in that context? Well, I, I don't know any of, you know, I'm not as, as proficient a reporter as you, so I have very little inside information, but publicly, mm -hmm. I think she made it very clear that the city of Oakland was not going to subsidize this man's play toys, mm -hmm. that we were not, go the city was not going to go in debt to build him a stadium, and he's a, he owns a billion-dollar asset. He should be able to find the money to build his own stadium. Mm -hmm. And I, I, without having to do any kind of polling, I would <laughs> have it to guess that, 80 to 90% of the Oakland uh, citizens felt the same way. Yeah. And so uh, she uh, she made that very publicly clear. And after that, um, I don't think anybody blames her for, quote, losing the Raiders. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't think anybody blames her for not giving in to this, to this, um, borderline incompetent business person mm -hmm. hey on that note how do you you've been around as i say a long time how has oakland politics changed um well i think the biggest change in oakland's politics in the last 10 15 years has been the amount of money that's involved and the influence by a very few number of groups. And I think it's, unfortunately, it's had a very bad impact on, on Oakland politics. Hmm. When it costs 
cost you over a hundred thousand dollars to run for a district city council seat where less than six five thousand votes are going to be cast mm -hmm. that's a lot of money to try to raise especially at seven hundred dollars a pop and so the you know there's only a few unlike san francisco where there's a lot of competing interests who have money to support their positions. Mm -hmm. You really don't have a lot of competing interest in Oakland. The largest financial player in Oakland local politics is uh, the, the county labor union organization. Yeah. And that's primarily, you know, government employees unions who raise the most money and you have a few individuals who have a lot of money that they can put in the politics but there's not a lot of competing interests like that and everybody wants to talk about how big business owns Oakland well not really there there is no big business pack that is spending huge amounts of money mm -hmm. It's mostly individuals if it's not coming from union organizations. And so as a result, the politics are very skewed. And quite frankly, I think you saw an example of that, and if we can segue to it. You saw an example of that when the Proctor School District just flat out said no to the Oakland A's. Yep. Um, well, well done. Well done, Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was not a very informed decision. That was a decision made by a special interest who essentially controls the majority of the people on the Peralta School District because they couldn't have gotten elected without that money. Mm -hmm. So as a result... What's that special interest? Uh, it's the Alameda County Labor C Council. As you were saying, okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're the only... I mean, think about it. What competing interest cares about who gets elected to a community college board. You know, actually, I hadn't thought about that, but you're right. I really had not thought about that. You know, yeah. who is it? Textbook sales people? <laughs> they don't care. Right. They're going to sell books to whoever got elected. Mm -hmm. So the primary group is the workers at the community college district represented by their, their union. And there's no competing interest on the other side. And so this decision is not a good decision. It's very hasty, and it wasn't thought out in what's in the best interest of Oakland mm -hmm. and what will benefit the most people in Oakland. And uh, I just, it's, it's just the, the problem that is, is occurring in Oakland politics, that interests are not being made or decisions are not being made that what's in the best interest for the city but it's being made in what's in the best narrow interest of, of a very few interest groups. Hey, so do you think, and, you know, and I, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. do you think that the A's should have been fooling around with Peralta? Because you remember when Russo was city attorney and that report came out analyzing all the sites in 2001, Howard Terminal was not top ranked, excuse me, neither was, but even then Peralta was even lower ranked. And you had the Uptown that was number one. I think Coliseum was number two or three, somewhere in there. And then, you know, Forest City came in. You know, I'm the guy who brought Forest City in, but Jerry Brown stole them from me. Okay, that's actually documented fact. But uh, Well, we should blame you for it then, because <laughs> that baseball stadium should have been built right where that Forest City development is. But see, I didn't want that Forest City. That would have been I, the I most didn't... ideal place for Absolutely. that stadium. Absolutely, but, but I, didn't want, I didn't want Forest City to do housing. The idea was for Forest City to be a master developer of a redeveloped uptown, which was to be like a Times Square of the West Coast, but we didn't X out baseball, and baseball would have been very much part of the plan. We were gonna have different developers and Forest City would be the master, all right? And I gave a presentation to the International Council of Shopping Centers, uh, at, excuse me, I gave a presentation to Forest City at the International Council of Shopping Centers spring, a convention 
in July of 1998 and 97, excuse me. And that was to Greg Vilken, Susan Smart, uh, eight people from Forest City. Larry Reed was there. I think uh, Robert Bob, of course, Kofi Bonner, you know, and uh, that was, yeah, it was 97. And that's what got the ball rolling. And then Jerry came in and quite literally stole for a city, Susan Smart and Craig Vilkin, not only under, out from under my nose, but Elihu will tell you that, and I didn't know this until what, I, you know, I, I just found this out like last year, that Forest City, according to Elihu, uh, had, was the recipient of a $70 million profit promise from then Mayor Jerry Brown. That's what Elihu said. He said that even on my show. And I was like, what? So, you know, that's why that turned out the way that it did. It wasn't that, you know, we had it parked in there. But the whole idea was to make Uptown like the gas lamp in terms of having uniform signage, uniform street design, uniform design guidelines uh, for not just the infrastructure, but also for the buildings that were to go up in it and kind of recreate the look and feel of the old theater district of the 20s in Oakland. That was the idea. But now we don't we don't have it. We still don't have that. We have a hodgepodge, you know, and but that's what I was trying to do. That was the idea. And well, in all due respect, you failed me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Four City Build Apartments. <laughs> Four City Build Apartments because former Mayor Harris is absolutely right. It's a public record. Go look at the documents from their deal. Mm -hmm. They got a guaranteed profit. They had no risk in the deal. The city essentially gave them the land and, and financed their development and guaranteed them a percentage profit. So you or I or two people you could find off the street could have done this development because it didn't have any risk to it. And so they built the basic thing that stayed within the parameters where they wouldn't incur any risk, which was, you know, these nondescript apartment buildings. We can say that again. And instead, it could have been a baseball stadium mm -hmm. that would have bought 3 million people a year in the downtown Oakland. That would have created your gaslight district because 3 million people need a place to eat and drink and be entertained and to stay and spend money. Right. Absolutely. People living, a few thousand people living in apartments, they're not going out of their apartment to go spend hundreds oh. of dollars a night. Hey, you're preaching they're to the going choir. To... I mean, hey, look, Jerry Brown, so, Jerry Brown, I'll tell you, it was, I'll tell you that when this happened. It was June 12th, 2002 at 1231 in the afternoon on a conference call when Jerry Brown said, and I quote, excuse the vulgar language, he says, there's not going to be a fucking baseball stadium in downtown as long as I'm mayor of Oakland. That's exactly what he said. Okay. And then shortly thereafter, he fired Robert Bob. That's what happened. So. I don't doubt it, but yeah. uh, the bottom line is it was, it was a wrong decision. Oh, and completely. had the stadium been built, downtown would look radically different than it looks now. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely right. Uh, hey, how you doing on time, because by the, the way? The stadium would now have been, the stadium now would have been 12 years old. Yep. Yeah. And quite successful. Instead, we have, well, you know, what we have. Hey. Uh, we have an apartment building. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> A nondescript apartment building that could have been built in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> or Kathmandu. Hey, how do you forecast the mayor's race? Is there anybody that can challenge Mayor Schaff? Well, again, it boils down to, you know, who can raise money to run against an incumbent mm -hmm. and where's that money going to come from? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's just a hard, that's just a hard road to hold because it's difficult to raise money in Oakland politics. And as a non-incumbent, it's even harder. And uh, even with ranked choice voting, yep, it's it does. It, you you still got to have enough money to to pay to Annie to get into the game. Mm -hmm. 
Do you think ranked choice? And, do you think ranked choice when he's damaged Oakland politically? I mean, ranked choice voting is is kind of a gimmicky type of thing. I don't think it's had much. I wouldn't call it damage. It, it's changed the way elections are run because you have to be cognitive of people who aren't being supportive of you because you need to get their second or third place vote to stay to stay viable as a candidate. So in that sense, it's worked. But in terms of it being this great cure-all, that it was projected and touted to be when they were pushing for it? No. Oh, but you should explain. It's not that at all. Uh, what ranked choice voting uh -huh. is. Uh, we should explain what ranked choice voting is for the audience. Ranked choice voting is allows you, it's a form of what's called cumulative voting, but it allows you, instead of picking, for, picking one person you want for, say, mayor, you can pick your first choice, your second choice, and your third. And... What could happen is what happened with, and Clinton, you remember this, Jean, to Jean Kwan, where she gained the most second place choice votes of any other candidate, even though Don Parada, who was the favorite, got the most first place votes. Parada did no politicking. Kwan and Oakland at large council member Rebecca Kaplan teamed up and basically said, hey, you know, vote for me. If you're going to vote for, her then vote for me second or vice versa right and that worked in fact i remember and this is on a video i had uh clinton I, it's actually had I, this had i still have it up i went to russo's office because we always do these post-election videos right you know check-ins and mm -hmm. he he said and it's right there on video it's hilarious he said look parada got 35 percent of the first choice votes there's no way anybody can beat that. The only way that could happen is if Gene Kwan got two thirds of the second choice, second place choice votes. And he said, and I quote, and that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> so then of course, <laughs> you hear the registrar started counting the votes. <laughs> and it happened. Well, and, and that's why. And it happened. Well, it's and like, that's, it, it, well, that's why it changed. Yeah, get this, Go back it, up. It, get this, get this, get this, get this, get this, get this. Russo called me the, that morning, the next morning, he goes, Zen, you got to take the video down. I said, why? Wow, you're a genius. You were right. <laughs> oh, so you were saying, well, sorry. Well, well, but, well, but you're missing the other variable of it. Okay. Don Parada didn't get any second or third place votes. No. Not just because Gene Kwan and Rebecca Kaplan said, okay, all my supporters do this and this. Mm -hmm. It's because he alienated everybody who wasn't voting for him. You know, I forget, you're right about and that. And yep. as a result, he, he wasn't going to be anybody's second choice. He was only going to get the votes of the people who supported him mm -hmm. and nobody else. And that's what occurred. So that's how it's changed Oakland politics because anybody who's running has to be very careful that they don't alienate uh, other sects of voters who are not their hardcore supporters because they need those people. Hmm. So in that way, it has changed in the sense that, I mean, I, I remember the last mayor's, uh, the last mayor's race when there was, what, seven people run? You mean 2014, that was for 15. That was 14. Yeah, how many people well, were? Well, actually, if you count Peter Liu, the guy that had the gun, it was 15. The guy that wound up with okay, David, well, you know. <laughs> I, remember being, I remember being at a mayor's forum, and someone would ask a question to one of the candidates, and they would give an answer, and then the moderator would say, well, does anyone have anything to add? And they would all go, well, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and none of them took any kind of position that, that, that was, you know, the opposite of the first person. Mm -hmm. And so it became the situation, well, why should I vote for you if you just agree with the other people who were running? You know, you, 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 you should have come to my sports forum because I had 14 and of the 15 candidates show up 
and basically divided into three camps. You had the leaders. You had remember Brian Parker, right? You had Brian Parker, Libby mm -hmm. Schaff, and Joe Tuman and Gene Kwan, and they had their plans, right? And then you had the people in the middle that basically agreed with what the leaders would say. And that was you know, our, our then current city, current auditor, actually her representative that she sent, Courtney Rupert sent a representative. And then you had the back of the pack folks led by King Houston and Lancey Sidebotham, who basically were just there because they were anti-JPA. You know, I mean, that's that's how it divided. You know, it was so, uh, it didn't matter. I mean, for example, and I should, in fairness, count Rebecca Kaplan as one of the leaders. But uh, I remember we, I had a question regarding the responsibility, oh, regarding the WNBA and the fact that we hadn't actually tried as a city to pitch, w, to get a WNBA team in Oakland, right? And, and what we we're going to do about that. And Rebecca really led the charge on how important that was. But the back of the back, the back of the pack crowd went right back in the whole, well, the JPA is corrupt and JPA is bad. And I actually had to say on camera, you know, can you stop parroting that, <laughs> that response? <laughs> actually, give us an answer to the question. <laughs> No, I love him. Yeah, I love him to death too, but is. it was funny, you know. The irony <laughs> Just, of it is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. What go ahead. Is, no, no, no. The irony of it is, or the unintended consequence of that is, if somebody is willing to be bold enough to tap into discontent, they will do well in the election. That's. And, and do you think that that's there? Oh, by the way, uh, Malcontent has a question. He asks, "Has Mr. Killian already said what he thinks?" The city of Oakland should do to facilitate a new new a stadium. And actually, that's a good question, Clinton. So there's the question: What do you think the city should do to facilitate a new a stadium? Thank you, Amal Content. That's a great question. I think they should honestly sit down with DAs and say, "Look, let's identify a site. You come up with the money, and let's get it built." Um, I know the, the A's want a site that's close to public and then is going to have some great sight line. Mm -hmm. But the problem they're going to run in with that is there's just not a whole lot of public land available for those kinds of, of buildings. So honestly, what I think the A's are going to have to do is John Fisher is going to have to reach into his gap pockets and come up with a large chunk of money and acquire the land privately and build a stadium. And uh, if he's willing to put his capital into it, it can be done. And there are lots of tracts of, of decent land that is not publicly owned that he could um he could easily buy and he can build his stadium would you like to see that as hard terminal well again that's public land mm -hmm. and the access to howard terminal is public land now i think you need to, to go find the track mm -hmm. and buy it And the good thing about a baseball stadium is you don't have to buy a big track. And you don't even have to, as the Giants have shown, you don't even have to build parking. Or as the Chicago Cubs and the White Sox and the Denver team and numerous others have shown, you don't need parking around a baseball stadium. And so realistically, there are still decent tracks within walking distance of a BART station mm -hmm. that John Fisher can reach into his gap money and be able to buy it and construct a stadium. Another thing is, you know, you don't have to build a big baseball stadium. Hey, it sounds like you're, you know, you're not building 60,000, 70,000 seats. You're building 30,000. 5,000. Right, right. 
that's this is bigger than than you know Diablo Valley College's football stadium holds like what twelve fifteen thousand. Mm-hmm. So you're not talking about a huge stadium. So you don't need a lot of land. And the construction costs are not that great in terms of the difference between building that and a football stadium. So you can privately finance it. After all, the Giants have paid off their stadium. Yep. And it was privately financed. Yep. So the revenue stream from a decent baseball team is more than enough to pay off a stadium. And is not going to come from a public entity, whether it's the city, the county, the school district. You're not going to get land on the cheap. You're going to have to pay a price, but it can be done. I got some comments I want to share with you. Uh, MM Forever says, wow, listen to this guy proves Oakland government is so clueless. I don't blame the A's for leaving, uh, for leaving with dealing with people like this. <laughs> Uh, is it <laughs> on that note? I mean, how can we evaluate? Let me put it another way. We've got okay. In District Two, we've got Abel Guillen, who's running for re-election. We've got in District Four, Andy Campbell Washington is running for re-election. We got in District Six, Desley Brooks is running for re-election, and we have the mayor of Oakland running for re-election as well as three school board positions, if I'm not mistaken. Of all of those, yeah. who, who's the most vulnerable? I have no idea. Um, because I I only live in one district. You know, on the offhand, since there's virtually no media in Oakland. True. I'm bad try, publicity. I'm, try, I'm, trying, to, I'm publicity trying to change that, Clint. <laughs> I'm trying to change that. Yeah, and, you, and you're doing a great job. Thank you. But uh, in, in such a media limited city, bad publicity is 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 terrible. It's better you know not to be known at all than it is to be known negatively. Hmm. And so certainly, I think uh, Councilwoman Brooks is out of that group you just described is the most vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Hey. Um. I don't know any of the school board members, but I think if I was a parent or I had a or had a ch- child in the Oakland school system, I would be pretty pissed right now that mm-hmm. they have overspent their budget already and are cutting the services while they're giving themselves a raise. Mm-hmm. And I think there's going to be a huge backlash to those uh, um school board members Um, because again the biggest problem in Oakland local elections is turnout Mm -hmm. hey Clint can you tell the viewers who may not know what the Oakland situation is with the deficit just so we're not I'm trying to I'm trying to open it out more so that people are not kind of trying to guess at what's going on can you give them a skinny well just just in simplistic terms Mm -hmm. the, the school district because of this the state oversight they have to keep a certain amount of money in reserve and they have to stay within a certain spending budget and the last superintendent who ran out of town as soon as he got whiff of another job authorized excessive spending that not only dug in and dip the reserve below the state mandated level, but he also overspent the budget, giving things like raises to administrators and um, horrendous construction um, improvements that have been, you know, massively overrun, and just, I just. Just shoddy bill, uh, just shoddy management. Let's just be honest. Mm-hmm. If I gave you a, if I gave you a thousand dollars, you're not gonna blow it all on one thing. You're gonna spend it on a hundred things that you shouldn't spend it on. Yeah. And so the bottom line is the 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 district is running a deficit, which it cannot do because if it does, the state will 
take control of it as they did about, what, six years ago. Yep. And they'll manage the school district's finances. So in order to stay in compliance, they had to cut uh, they had to cut things out of the budget. Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, during all of this discussion, the school board votes to get themselves a raise. Well, it's pretty hard to say to a teacher, well, we're going to cut out all the art supplies for your classroom because we don't have the money, but we're going to give ourselves a raise. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I even I talked to a teacher. The optics who, on that. She was getting evicted. Horrendous. Yeah. Uh -huh. I talked to a teacher uh, about a year ago plus who was getting evicted and talked talked about you know how she could not find a place to live, a decent place to live on her salary. In 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 the middle of all this, and she you know she had a she had a billboard on uh, on her person, and she was walking around. Oakland Farmers Market on Grand Lake on Saturday. You know where that is. With and I had to stop right. and say. I said stop and I said, hey, can you uh you know tell me why you're doing this? And she told me. You know I knew, I, but I wanted to hear it from her. Of course, sad story, but I just wanted to throw that in as uh you know um a kind of an 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 addition to what you're saying. Mm hmm. Of, uh, and so it, it's, it is sort of like and, open and, policy. And, oh, and malcontent, malcontent says the OSD, the Open Unified School District, doesn't have any worthwhile planning, financial planning, and oversight. So there you go. Yeah, and so they're running the risk of the state stepping in and, and taking control of their budget again. Mm -hmm. Because if they stay without if if they if they don't have the level of reserves that are required by state law when they got out of this receivership and if they are running a deficit in their operations then the state will step back in and take control mm -hmm. hey so, so i'm sorry go ahead go ahead, go ahead. no i was going to say so it, what it boils down to is how much are Oakland voters willing to put up with before they say no more? And that's what it boils down to. Which gets me to the question regarding the police chief. When, how much, the police chief, in my view, is not the reform-minded person that we were led to believe she was going to be. But you said something we were talking about basically prep for this conversation that really stuck to my brain. And you said that, Zinni, do you realize that over a generation, almost a generation, we've been under, uh, if you will, federal control or federal oversight, and we've had a generation of cops that have went through Oakland without being retrained uh, in, a, in a better way to get us out of government oversight. And, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, there was a, a, a very bad problem with some rogue cops called the Riders in West Oakland that uh, were doing really heinous things to black youth under the idea that they were acting in a criminal way when in many cases they were not. Uh, they even had names like, like Batman and Robin and a lot of crazy stuff like that. Uh, well, that's what led to, and I'm really foreshortening a long story, but that's what led to the federal government saying, hey, you know, you have a corrupt police department and we're going to put it under federal oversight and watch watch and see if you can get better. And basically that hasn't happened. Am I characterizing that correctly, Clinton? Yeah, it's not the federal government, it's a federal judge. Federal judge. There is a federal yeah. judge who has complete control of the Oakland Police Department. Mm -hmm. And he has hired a monitor and an oversight person to review what the police department does. They get paid over each over a million dollars a year. Jesus Christ. And so for the last 18 oh, years, I'm in the, wrong line of business. <laughs> the city of Oakland's police department has been under control of a federal judge. Now, the reason that happened is because the city entered a voluntary 
agreement called a consent decree right. mm -hmm. where they voluntarily agreed that they would initiate and implement and maintain certain reforms of training and operation and procedure of the police department. So in 17 years, they still haven't done it. So what that means is, Vinny, there are now people who are 18 to 20 year veterans on the Oakland Police Force who have been under this federal judge's control their entire career and nothing has changed. So you've had, a, you've had an entire generation of Oakland police that could have been properly trained to the agreement that the city voluntarily entered and the reforms would have been in place, but instead the police department can has not reformed itself adequately to satisfy the, the agreement it entered. And so they are still under the control of a judge. And so at some point, when does this end? You only have 700 people there and you only have to retrain about half of them so that they're not violating the law. And you've had 18 years to do it and you still can't do it. What does that tell you? There is no desire to change. Right. And so you have entire generations of police uh, being hired by Oakland who are still being trained the same way that got them in trouble when they entered this uh, consent decree. Mm -hmm. And no one has the political courage to say this has to end. And then I might add... And certainly not this current chief who is just a, a, a continuation of the status quo. And it's because important, and Clint, it's important to add... Just like the federal government, just like the Republicans in the federal government have terrified people about terrorists and we have to spend money for the military. Mm -hmm. The Oakland Police Department has done the same thing to Oakland citizens. And Crime is rampant. If you don't let us do what we do, they'll be kicking in your doors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it's a, and, and it, Oakland it, voters, oh my God, we can't have that. We can't be soft on crime. Well, guess what? You're not getting anything better now. Right. We, have, we can't forget Celeste Guap and all this because in the middle of this consent decree, we got Celeste Guap, right? Celeste Guap is the, right. the young lady who I interviewed. I don't know if you, you may not know this. I interviewed her. I have the only 23-minute full interview with her before, you know, she gave her real name and, you know, went out to court. Uh, right here at Zenny 62. But that young woman at the center of the Oakland police sex scandal is what we're talking about. What are your thoughts about that and, and how, how that was handled? Oh, and, and by the way, did you see the force? not a sex scandal. Look, look, this okay. was a minor child and grown-ass men are having sex with a minor. Right. Jenny, right. you go out and have sex with a 15-year-old and find out what happens to you. I get hung, hung by the neck. When you, when, when you get out, your grandchildren will be graduating from Stanford. Cow. Instead, but anyway, <laughs> instead, these police did an internal investigation, which they tried to squash. They didn't do their job. They tried to intimidate and cover this whole thing up. Mm -hmm. And nobody went to jail for this. Nobody, th this this is statutory rape. This That's is right. not a sex scandal. This is a rape of a minor. Right, absolutely. And I don't care absolutely. what I could not have said doing. it better. You're right. She absolutely is right. a minor. That's a right. minor cannot consent to adult activities. That's why 15-year-olds can't go out and buy a car because they can't sign a contract. So I don't care what her, quote, experience was. These are grown-ass men. Yep having sex with a minor girl yep. and not a damn thing happened to them. And it starts right from the top in this city from the police chief on down and no one was held responsible for it. That's right. Not the former police chief, not the former police chief's wife who mm -hmm. tried to suppress it. Yep. And you talk about a conflict, the police chief and his wife are involved in it, and neither one of them suffered any consequences for their obviously illegal activities. 
And then the DA doesn't prosecute anybody? Come on. This is a joke. Yeah. But yet, everybody's still okay. I mean, you know. Right. Everybody's okay because, after all, they're preventing crime. Well, Mm -hmm. you know, crime is not the great cure. If you're going to live your life in so much fear, you need to go somewhere else. (laughs) Because just because... You know, we need police doesn't mean that they should get a blank check and be able to behave any way that they want. And it doesn't mean that the city of Oakland should constantly write a check to cover up their malfeasance. Right. We're already writing $2 million a year to the federal judge and his subordinates. How many more to see again? Where's the tipping point? If it's going to cost the city $10 million a year for for police malfeasance, is that enough to make the voters respond? And that's why I asked. Twenty because, million, yeah, I mean, thirty million. And, what, where's the tipping point? Where's yet, the tipping point? And yet, get this: you have the police chief. Do you realize the police chief called the president of the city council? I think it was two and a half weeks ago. I was told, found this out, to have Desley Brooks, who is the chair of the public safety committee that you know provides some police oversight, if you will, removed who has actually challenged the sitting police chief. I'm talking about council member Brooks. Do you realize that, okay, I mean, get this, get this, Clinton. Okay, you have the chief of police who is appointed by the mayor, not going to the mayor to do it, all right, but making the call on her own. And then Larry Reed, the president of the Oakland City Council, admitted to the council that the story that I broke was true. That, hey, that's that he did that. Oh, and by the way, the conversation that they had it's, we're not privy to that. That's what he said publicly. What do you think? Well, I think that a subordinate who goes over the head of her superior to lobby an elected official mm-hmm. should be held accountable for those actions. Thank you. Thank you. And she and yet has not been, you know? Has not been, and and Larry and Larry, God love him, and, I, and Larry's like my brother. You think, folks, the thing you have to understand about Oakland politics, you have a lot of people. We're like giant family, you know. It's like 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 I say this about Ignacio De La Fuente. Ignacio can go politically screw the heck out of you, or try to, and then have a drink with you later and laugh about it. That's Oakland, but you know, the whole point is it doesn't cover up how serious and how dastardly. Uh, dicey these situations get and what clinton and i are talking about last right now is one of those situations with our current police chief but also you got to admit clinton that the mayor appointed her the mayor standing behind her but no one's challenging the mayor we have right now we have ken houston and i'm not saying no one i mean uh, and i'm not i don't mean to disparage the people i'm naming but i'm just being honest because they're friends of mine ken houston saeed kamaru's uh kylie uh, Karen Moore, who I haven't met yet, uh, who was on Bay Area Women Against Rape, um, Cedric Troop, who I know nothing about, and of course the incumbent Libby Shaft, that's five, and there's one more I'm leaving out, Nancy Sidebotham, that just announced she's going to run. That's six. And there's, there's a seventh guy, too, uh, Brent, I've never heard of, Brent something or other, that made himself known on a Facebook page, but I asked him, have you actually put your 301 and 501, you know, um, documents in, and I didn't get an answer from him, and I haven't checked yet. But my point is, you only have Libby, who's the giant, and you have no challenger. So by this time, in 2014, do you realize we had 12 candidates? We had double the number? Double. I mean, that doesn't say anything for our ability to change what we have. Am I wrong? Well, in, well, it also, unfortunately, it says more about the voters than it does the person holding the office. Mm-hmm. What, does it say? Um, what does it say? You know, the mayor has done enough good things that no one has a negative impression or there's not a massive negative impression of her. Mm-hmm. Unlike her predecessor, who seemed to go out of her way to alienate the voters. That was Gene Corn. Mm-hmm. And Libby hasn't done that. 
Libby's done enough good things and she gets enough positive response that there's there's nothing hanging over her head. I mean, when Jean Kwan was running for re-election in 14, look at all many things she had hanging over her head. Mm-hmm. Negative things. But you don't think the homeless well, issue is something that is hanging over Libby's head? Or Remember, did you see how Cat Brooks went over to her house and tried to camp out? Which I thought was not the best way to handle the situation, but I mean... Well, yeah, I mean... You know, but but again, what, what nobody, everybody says, oh, homeless is terrible, mm-hmm. but they're not really willing to spend the money to do anything about it. Right. And so the mayor isn't, you know, the mayor would get more negative press if she sent public works down there and tell them to clean out the encampments. Mm-hmm. What do you remember? I mean, in 1931, when the veterans marched on, white male veterans marched on Washington, D.C. to try to get Herbert Hoover to release their veteran pensions early so that they could survive the Depression. And Herbert Hoover sent troops to to push them out of the the parks in D.C., That's what Herbert Hoover is, is known is remembered for. He create he destroyed the Hoovervilles. Open up any history book at any level, and that's what it describes Herbert Hoover as. Mm-hmm. So Libby's not going to gain any 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 traction or any solution by just pushing on the way. Most people feel a certain level of compassion towards homeless people. Mm-hmm. They just don't know what you can do to fix it. And don't forget, because nobody wants to give away free housing. Or, hey, Glenn, don't don't forget the but People's sure Park to, example. Remember People's Park with Michael Perchovis and those folks in 1993, and how they got you know evicted out of People's Park during that attempted sit-in. Right. Yeah. So, but my point is, nobody wants to give homeless people free housing, which is the only solution. So anything that someone tries to do, they're going to say, well, she's trying, to, she's trying. Right. But she's not going to gain any, any advantage by sending bulldozers down there and moving people out. Um, so homeless is different. Um, now, if, if these were not, quote, homeless people, but you know, like the Occupy Oakland mm-hmm. that just destroyed the downtown park. Yeah. If Gene Kwan had sent the bulldozers and cleaned out the park, she'd be there now. Yeah, that's what Ellie said right when it happened. I remember we had that yeah. conversation. I mean, yeah. and, and she taken a stand immediately and say, okay, you're making a protest, but you can't tear up Oakland. Right. No breaking windows. No defecating all over the public park. Mm-hmm. No tearing the place apart. Otherwise, we're moving you out. And when you do it, we're, you're gone. And if she had moved them out, she'd be there right now. Yeah, I, I have a video. But nobody views the homeless that way. No, I have a video of my conversation with the late Sanjeev Honda at, at City Hall Plaza the day after the eviction and behind us are these guys in biohazard suits. You remember that? <laughs> Just... Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> that was crazy, man. <laughs> I mean, had, these guys had biohazard no, but, but suits. It had, but it had gotten that bad. Yeah, it had. Yeah. I can remember. I can remember walking past there and being a block away from the downtown city hall plaza and smelling the stench mm-hmm. a block away. Mm-hmm. And so at some point, that's that's not a protest, that's destruction. Right. And had the mayor shown some leadership, like I said, the former mayor would be mayor today had she shown any type of leadership, but she didn't. Nope. Not at all. And I find it very ironic that they all figure they're going to protest all these injustices in Oakland, and yet they don't protest it in Berkeley. Or the financial center of California, San Francisco. Why is that? Oh, please, you know why. Yeah, because I Oakland want you to hear it. I want Oakland you to say it. <laughs> Oakland is a 
Oakland is perceived by the Bay Area, particularly the progressive set, as a place where they could dump on without any recriminations. Right. How long was there an Occupy San Francisco? There, there barely was one. Five minutes? Yeah. 20 minutes? How long did that last? It didn't. When was Berkeley occupied? Never. This, you know, progressive capital of the world. We are on the vanguard of all social change. How come they didn't have an occupied Berkeley? Hey, Berkeley is welcome more Trump supporters of late than anything else, if you noticed. Exactly, exactly. So that's my point. So they said, oh, let's go dump in Oakland. Let's go break windows in Oakland. Mm -hmm. and, and so, again, it takes political will to be able to make things work. And unfortunately, there's just not a lot of political will. There's... You know, there are some good people in Oakland government, but they don't have the full lever of power right. to do something. And, uh, you know, and, and some of the council people do a very good job of taking care of their district. You know, you mentioned Larry Reed. I think Larry Reed should be applauded despite whatever political differences you have on him. Oh, no, I love you Larry. Walk through District 7. No, I'm talking about anybody in Oakland. Oh, I get you. Whatever political difference you have, one thing you can do is you can walk through District 7 and see how he has improved it over Amen. the 20 years he has served. Immeasurably. I mean, tremendously. Right. Lincoln Burger, and so, every place. Yep. And so he's done his job. Yep. But citywide, there's just not, there's just not that... that that political will to do the unpopular thing to get control of the police department and to make it function under the guidelines that it agreed to 18 years ago mm -hmm. so, and so and that's the unfortunate part about oakland so in all this we gotta have, like a, in all this you gotta I mean, we gotta retain uh, sports so we can have something to cheer about right I mean, my guy, William Donald Schaefer, the, the mayor of Baltimore, once said that, you know, every city has its pathologies, and we're talking about them. But you have to have mm -hmm. some things to do that allow you to enjoy life. Don't you agree? Oh, absolutely. And the, the irony of what is viewed Oakland's renaissance or change or whatever you want to call it has been the infusion of pri private capital into this city mm -hmm. that it's ironic that uh, the 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 energy that has come to oakland has not been publicly or public government generated it's been private capital hey i predicted and that you know result, i predicted that 94 in my Mont montclarian i said that was going to happen i said we were going to get to a point yeah. you know where we didn't rely on redevelopment to catalyze growth. And, you know, you have to admit, thanks to Jerry Brown, uh, by his presence removing institutional investor racism to a degree, that happened. The trouble is that, you know, Jerry kind of ignited this this firestorm of, of market rate housing development. Then he, took, then he took away redevelopment. And now we brought it back and we don't know how to use it. So now we got more market rate housing, you know, than we need. We need affordable housing. <laughs> it's wild. Well, we, we need more housing. Yeah. The, 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 Oakland is a city of about 350,000 people where it could easily be a city of 600,000. Mm -hmm. And because we don't have, you know, enough housing, period, the way you're going to get market or affordable housing is you expand the market. And so instead of people competing for just 10 units, if there's a thousand available units, that's going to make some of them much more affordable than others. And that's what's going on in Oakland. You can still drive through West Oakland and see huge tracts of empty land. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people can be living there. And when you create thousand more units, that's going to have the impact on the housing market much more than any government program can, because 
government subsidized housing cannot build enough units to quote make it affordable. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, and that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, the real focus. The real focus of Oakland is now less housing than it is jobs. Expand on that, please. Well, if all you're creating is housing without the re requisite jobs, you're just creating a bedroom community. Right. And so to keep people working, living where they work and spending money where they live and work, you have to have a, a certain level of, of employment and jobs. Mm -hmm. Because, you know... Instead of everybody having to drive to Silicon Valley or go across the bay to San Francisco, you create jobs here in Oakland and you're going to change the dynamic of the city. Because if, if I can build you housing and you can walk six blocks to your work, mm -hmm. you're going to stay here in Oakland and you're going to spend money in Oakland. You're going to create other jobs by doing that here in Oakland. Right now, that's not happening. And so the more jobs and the more economic activity that occurs in Oakland, the better it's going to be for everybody. So would you say economic development has failed us? We have an economic development department, but I don't know what they do. Well, they, they yeah, I mean, a government cannot be the driver of economic development. It can only be a complementary piece. <coughs> because by definition, the public government is not involved in private capital decisions. So they don't, there's very little they're going to be able to do to create jobs. What they have to do is be a complement to the job creating sectors. We can act as an incentive kind of, that's what we do with redevelopment. I remember when- Well, that's what I'm saying, but yeah. it's complimentary. Right, because I remember the when- The fact that know, the, largest apart, the, the largest commercial building going up in Oakland now mm -hmm. is on private land. I mean, land that was purchased from the city, but the building is going to be stocked with private companies. Mm -hmm that were recruited by the developer to come into their building once it gets completed. And you're talking about the one that's on Broadway and uh, 16th? No, I'm talking about the Shorenstein building on 12th and Clay. 12th and Clay, okay. Mm -hmm. There's so many large buildings going on. There's two. There's the Uber renovation, which is, you know... That's not really that big of a building. It's only four stories, yeah, but six it's, stories. It's squat, though. You know, it takes. It's a dominant player in the yeah. landscape, though. Yeah. And if you straighten it out, it's still not a very big building. Now, well, let's agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> Especially when you consider that they were to tear up Bart. You know, nineteen. You know, that, that's what I always. That's what I always love about reporters. They think they're experts in everything. But my background's in urban planning. This is where I live. Come on, well, man. And I'm and not only that, I'm not a journalist. Vinny, you taking, I'm not a journalist. I'm a blogger. Urban, <laughs> Vinny, when you were taking urban planning classes at, at Cal at Berkeley, number one school still, in the country. Number one school in the you, country. You were still, but you were still studying where to put the horses at night. Things have changed a little since you opened an urban planning book. I would, I would say, you know, you're talking to the guy. You're talking to the guy, Mr. F Funny Laugh there. You're talking to the guy that, that created not just the Coliseum Redevelopment Survey Area, but laid the groundwork via the formation of the Oakland Downtown Coalition for the 14th and Broadway Transit Corridor that exists today. So, hey, uh, look, you know, chuckle and you, chuckle you may, but contribute I have done. <laughs> In fact, you too, by the way, you've contributed as well. Hey, um, we could go on all night. I know you got, a, I know you got, you know, places to go and things to do. I guess, but um, yeah, <laughs> it's like the bed. It's I had no idea. Are you going to run from there? Are you right? going to run from there? Have you thought Am about I? it? Hell no, I'm not running from there. Are you crazy? <laughs> 
No, why not? Why? Wait, wait, wait. Why are you? Why? Why are you not running for mayor? Tell me. Just curious. Because I have a life. <laughs> because I have a wonderful wife. I can come home to every night and enjoy my house with her. And I admire people in public service now because. The time commitment they make is unbelievable. You literally cannot have a career and run for even something as small as the Oakland City Council. It's a full-time job. You know, they're not paid full-time. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to hold a job, a full-time job, and run for any political office, whether... Uh, I, I doubt if you could do it running for school board. So are you saying the council needs a raise? No, I, I just think, I mean, that's a whole nother, we can have a whole nother argument with that. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying the time commitment that these people put into their jobs is just unbelievable. That's why, you know, I, I read these things in social media. Oh, now that Desley Book has been found liable She'll never get elected again. Which is a joke. She, well, she's going to get reelected. You go talk to people in her district. <laughs> you go talk to people in her district. She delivers for her constituents. Mm -hmm. She spends an enormous amount of time interacting with people in her district. Yep. There's people who know her and how to reach her 24 hours a day in her district. And they do, and they call her, and she gets something done for them. Yes. Yes. But that requires her to work full time mm -hmm. at being a council person. Yep. She couldn't do it if she had a separate career. And that's why it's discouraging for people who have a career. You cannot, you, you can't have two careers because you're going to have to sacrifice one. Otherwise, you're going to do two jobs badly. And so, no, I, I admire them, and I have nothing but admiration for those elected officials who take their job seriously and uh, devote the amount of time that they do. It, it's, uh, and quite frankly, I enjoy being a lawyer, and I would find it very difficult to give up being a lawyer just to be a full-time politician. Hey, speaking of which, how can people contact you business-wise? Um, well, you want me to give you my email address? Sure, absolutely. So my email address is C Killian Law, C-K-I-L-L-I-A-N-L-A-W, at gmail.com. There you go. We got to have you back, man. This is fun. It was. You know? You know it, it was, this, this reminds me of when we would go to the big game and get there three hours early and right. talk about everything <laughs> but the football game. Right, exactly. That's exactly, that's, that's the idea of this. Uh, you know Cal's going to win this time. It's coming to Berkeley. I'm just saying. I love David Shaw. You know, love you, my brother, but I'm sorry. You guys are gonna, you guys are overdue for a, a licking. You only, now, you see, only won by three won points. What, nine years? Is it nine years or ten years in a row now? I forget. It's. I'll, I'll, let me put it this way, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a very stark but true statistic. All right. No black Stanford head coach has ever lost a big game. Do you realize that? Not one. Right. Denny Green, Denny. Tyrone Willingham, and now David Shaw. Right. <laughs> they've, all, they've all kicked Cal's butt, yet Cal has never hired a black coach. I'm just saying, okay? Right. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Well, you know, and this, this is the last thing we'll talk about, and we can pick this up before. All right. The worst thing that Cal has done is they've never hired a California coach. How in the hell do you think you're going <laughs> to win by hiring some good old boy from West Texas to come to Berkeley <laughs> and coach? You talking about Sonny Dykes. <laughs> you know, you hire a guy with a porn star name from West Texas, and he's supposed to be able to walk into somebody's house and, and, and 
Berkeley or L.A. or Sacramento or Salinas or Chico. We, we don't have Sunny anymore. We why have, they should come to Cal. We have Dave Wilcox. You know more about California than I know about West Texas. Right. We have we have Dave, so, we have Wilcox now. We 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 got a little better at that. I think. Well, yeah, and he has a marginal connection with California, but all these years, <laughs> Cal is gone doing this nationwide search to get these mediocre coaches from, you know, Bug Tussle, Texas, <laughs> who have never, you know, first of all, if I'm going to hire somebody that's not from around there, they better damn won like five conferences and went to bowl games and, and must be the hottest coach alive. I'm not going to hire a five and seven guy to come out here. <laughs> and that's what they have consistently done. So how long does David Shaw stay at Stanford before he goes to the NFL? Until, until he's never going to leave Stanford. He will stay at Stanford until he retires because Stanford has made it comfortable and possible for him to stay. Mm -hmm. And, he, I, you know, just like when Tyrone Willingham left and went to Notre Dame, that was a big I mistake. guarantee you, if you called mistake. Tyrone up, he would say, "I regret that day. I should have stayed at Stanford." Yep. And he could have retired at Stanford yep. because the pressure to win at Stanford is not is is a different type of pressure. They want you to win well, which means they want everybody to graduate. They want the team to be entertaining. And they want you to do well, but more importantly, they want you to represent the school well. David Shaw does that for Stanford. Oh, tremendously. And he can stay there as long as he wants because no one's ever going to put any pressure on him to do anything differently except open up the damn offense, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a bit of a problem last year. Actually, the last two years. You guys seem to go into the oh, tank. Man. It's like, my God. He's, he's gotten more and more conservative each year. It's like, enough already, David. This is not the wing T you're running. Come <laughs> so, on. <laughs> I'll ask him about that, the NFL draft. I saw him last year at Philadelphia. and uh, Ask him if he knows what a forward pass is. <laughs> well, actually, no, here, dude, you know what? You don't know this, but it's actually, I gave him a play. He kept it. And he admitted it. I'm sure he did. Yeah. I gave him a play on the flight to Chicago in 2014 to the NFL draft. He was in first class about to doze off. I had the stewardess. I was in economy plus. I asked, I drew up the play and I gave it, I had the stewardess give it to him. And it was a, um, a kind of a, uh, rollout, a, a fake reverse rollout pass. But at any rate, uh, of an, of an elegant design. Okay. Uh, with a circle route. Anyway, uh, he, Jason Cole, and this is all on video. Jason Cole asked him, he goes, did you use it? And Shaw said, well, I didn't, I didn't throw it away. <laughs> so, so there's my, there's my contribution to you guys, sort of, because, you know, I, Sonny would never listen to me. Although, I, you know, Sonny was a great politician for a few years, but, uh, I haven't met Wilcox yet. I wanted, I wanted Cal to hire a black coach. I'm just being honest. I was kind of like, you know. Hire a black guy. And then we have a, a black interim AD, and I thought maybe he'd do it, and all the guys he interviewed was white, which is a real head-scratcher to me. So, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, he hired a black basketball coach. Yes, yeah. But that's basketball. Hired two of them. He right. hired two of them. But, right. no, I agree with you. I mean, Cal had a chance to hire Marvin Lewis, and yeah. they went for Jeff Tedford. Right. We could have had Derek Mason. We didn't even go after him. Derek Mason was you guys' defensive coordinator. Right. You we know? would have loved to have stayed in California and coached Cal. Never went after him. We didn't go after Pep Hamilton. He was your offensive nope. coordinator. Remember that? Then he went to the Colts. Yeah. So, I mean, we let a lot yeah. of great, qualified black talent just simply leave without even talking to them. This is ridiculous, you know. And and you know, I I I would support Cal if they just hired someone who had California connections mm -hmm. and who could recruit in California. There's no way in hell that the 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 University of California flagship school should not be getting 
every recruit in the state of California that they want. Right. Cal should have the best offensive line, the best running backs, the best wide receivers, and the best quarterbacks in the state coming to Berkeley. Yep. No, we should. Although I will say about this recruiting class, We've got the fastest set of linebackers I've ever seen in my life at Cal. That that says something. Well, good. I'm, I'm, and I bet they're all from California, aren't they? They are. Yeah, they are. You have to be able to recruit in your backyard mm-hmm. first. Mm-hmm. And if you can't recruit in your backyard, you're not going to win bringing people from Abilene, Kansas out. <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> oh. On that note, folks, uh, tomorrow night we have Steve Lowe. <laughs> Steve Lowe is at 9 o'clock, and we're going to have a discussion very much like I had with Mr. Killian here. Steve Lowe is – well, how would you describe Steve Lowe, Clinton? You know Steve. I, I think Steve is a person who's committed to Oakland being better. He has a lot of – bright, innovative ideas. And the beauty of Steve is you don't have to agree with everything he comes up with, but you have to give him credit for thinking things out. Yes. Yeah. And he's always engaging when you talk with him because he brings a perspective that most people don't see. And he can hold a very cogent conversation about his position and uh, he doesn't take it personally when you disagree with him, unlike many people in the city of Oakland. Yeah, that's true. That's true. He's also one of the three creators of Coliseum City, the original concept. So we're going to start out talking about that. Yeah, give a listen if you can, Clinton. You know, it'll be, be a lot of fun. One day he's going to figure out a way to technically bring everybody together as one. But it's fun to give everybody their platform. You know, this is, this is cool. Like well, this. nine o'clock tomorrow, I will be listening. All right, <laughs> and you and you keep up the good work you're doing. I'm okay. glad I discovered your YouTube channel because it's been informative to look through the, the former videos that you've posted and uh, see a whole different perspective and insight on issues that you're not going to read in the in the uh, Bay Area media. Nope, no, not at all. Hey, thanks a lot, man. Get some sleep. And everybody, I will see you all. Uh, in fact, stick around, Clinton. Uh, folks, I will see you all tomorrow. Remember, that the time is 9 o'clock for Steve Lowe. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. This was at 8 o'clock. We're going to start at 9 o'clock with Steve. And I'm going to do a separate... Well, no, I'm going to start at 9 o'clock with Steve Lowe tomorrow. It's 9 o'clock, which is 12 midnight Eastern. Um... Although I may do a separate live stream at 8 o'clock just to get some other news out of the way. So so stay tuned for that. But you'll see the previews. You'll see the live stream previews in both cases, all right, in terms of the start times. And I'll be promoting Steve's appearance. And then don't forget, Wednesday, 2 o'clock, the great super sports agent and longtime friend Lee Steinberg. And then Thursday... 8 o'clock, Coliseum Joint Powers Authority board member Chris Dobbins. So this is a great, fantastic week. Thanks, Clinton. I'll see you. Oh, don't stick around. Well, stick thank around. You, Vinny. Yeah, stick around. Hey, and folks. Keep up the good work. You guys, stick around, Clint. Folks, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, hey, thank you.